Our text today is from chapter 12 of the book of Kings. Therefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord. An old proverb says, large doors swing on little hinges. And if that is true, you have in this text a small hinge upon which the whole history of Israel was to turn. A scarcely a dozen words spoken rashly. And then the nation established by David, consolidated by Solomon, is torn in two. And it's followed by 400 years of strife and warfare and finally desolation. King Solomon had died. His son Rehoboam assumed the throne in Jerusalem. His clansmen from the tribe of Judah acclaimed him as king immediately. It was odd that none of the other tribes of Israel were present. Perhaps they had not been invited. The other ten tribes and their men gathered far to the north in Shechem, the capital of Ephraim. Shechem had always been, from time immemorial, the meeting place of the people. And possibly Rehoboam felt that it was a mere formality to go up to Shechem and be coronated the king. He maybe felt that he was doing these outlanders an honor by paying a visit to them. Now there was another ominous sign. As soon as Solomon died, the man Jeroboam was recalled from Egypt and returned to Israel. Jeroboam early on had been a favorite of King Solomon because of his ability and ambition and energy. Solomon made Jeroboam overseer of the forced laborers of the land. But Rehoboam and Jeroboam had come up through the ranks. And the working men always saw in Jeroboam a kindred spirit. He was one of them. He knew where the shoe pinched. He sympathized with their grievances and he understood their cause. It was not clear whether Jeroboam fanned the flames of discontent against Solomon or whether he openly plotted rebellion against the crown, but Solomon tried to kill him. So Jeroboam fled to Egypt. Now years later, when the men, the laborers, are looking for a leader and a spokesman, they remember Jeroboam and call him back from Egypt. It must have been a memorable scene there in the mountain amphitheater at Shechem. As the working men from the ten tribes encamped at the foot of the twin mountain peaks. And then arrived the entourage of King Rehoboam from Jerusalem with fluttering of banners and royal pageantry. Ah, but the air was chilly because there was no festivity. The leaders presented a petition to King Rehoboam. Your father laid a heavy yoke on us. And if you will make the yoke lighter, we will serve you. They felt that the heavy burden of taxation and the forced labor was unacceptable for free men. And all they want is concession. They do not ask for independence. Rehoboam requested three days to consider the matter. First he consulted with the old elders who had once advised his father. What do you advise that I should answer these people? And they strongly advised concession, at least temporarily. If today you will serve the people and speak good words to the people, they will serve you forever. But that is not what Rehoboam wanted to hear. And so like people today, he found some counselors to tell him exactly what he did want to hear. 
Rehoboam consulted with the young men, the text tells us, who had grown up with him. Now you can imagine that. Growing up in the excess of splendor and luxury of Solomon's court with the crown prince, pampered, undisciplined, indulging every whim and appetite. What do you advise that I shall tell the people? Rehoboam said to his pals, don't discuss their demands. They are testing your authority. You tell them that they are dealing with a monarch mightier than Solomon ever was. You teach them this little song to sing. My little finger is thicker than my father's thigh. My father made your yoke heavy, I will make it heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. Scorpions are whips too. But the leather thongs are laced with sharp metal barbs. Oh, those are fighting words. Bravely spoken. And they're going to have to fight to back them up sooner than they realize. So it was that Rehoboam took the stupid advice of his friends. And to the working men of Israel who gathered again three days later, he recited to them the little poem. My father made your yoke heavy. I will make it heavier. He scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpion. The effect was immediate and it was incendiary. Hey, that's clever, your little ditty. You want clever? Try this old song. To your tents, O Israel. It was the ancient war cry of rebellion in Israel. Immediately, nine-tenths of Israel renounced allegiance to the house of David. They broke off the negotiation and marched away. Too late, Rehoboam realizes the fatal error. He tries to recover what he's lost, but even that was a mistake. Get this. He sends after them the superintendent of forced labor to bring those rebels back to the conference table. The working guys took that as adding insult on the injury. And they stoned the superintendent to death. And in the pandemonium and passion of the moment, Rehoboam narrowly escapes in his chariot and returns again to Jerusalem. Just like that, 10 of the 12 tribes are a separate and independent kingdom. And that break between the two will never be healed. A thousand years later, in the New Testament times, the hostility will still be there between the Jews and the Samaritans. Now, if you've been following along with us here, you probably could have figured it would come to this. In fact, if you have any feel at all for human psychology, for economic and political trends, you could have predicted this outcome. The issue was determined long before Rehoboam ever made that foolish journey to Shechem. And long before he uttered his imbecilic put-down of the working people, that was merely the spark to a keg of dynamite that had been building up for a long time. There was a contrast between the luxury of the king's court in Jerusalem and the common people in general. A growing disparity between the haves and the have-nots. The easy life of the affluent versus the hard life of the laborers. 
and a growing resentment against Solomon's foreign alliances, foreign marriages, foreign gods. And add to that the centuries-old tribal jealousies, especially of the largest tribe of Ephraim against the dynasty of Judah. And all it needed was a leader. And Ephraim furnished a leader in the man Jeroboam. Now that is a perfectly logical view of things. And if you had said all that, I'll bet you your history teacher would have given you a B plus. But that's not the way the Bible teaches the story. In the 15th verse, the curtain is drawn aside for a moment and you and I are given a glimpse of the true state of affairs. The king did not listen to the people because this turn of events was from the Lord. Below, everything is passionate, and angry, discontent. And above, the Lord is in complete control working out his purposes when it does not seem that he is working anything at all. Stated bluntly, this disaster, which would be to the regret of everybody involved, was brought about by God. Divine vengeance uses the design of human disobedience. Some people say, Rehoboam went wrong in listening to the young guys instead of the advice of the wise old heads. But did he? The old guys said, today, flatter them. Tomorrow, do to them what you want. Today, tell them anything they want to hear. Tomorrow, when you're in the saddle, let them feel your spur. But that's the same thing the young guys were saying. The same naked and undisguised selfishness to exploit the people for their own profit. Don't you get it? This is what had become wisdom in Israel. Nobody asks what's right or honest or true or good. They all want to know what's expedient, what works today. All the hassle was about material things. Nobody in here, neither prince nor people, are righteously indignant about the godlessness. Nobody repents, returns to God. Both sides got their own arguments. Neither side thinks that God is relevant. It wasn't that Rehoboam Listen to the counsel of the young men. Rehoboam didn't take any counsel from God. It wasn't that the working men of Israel planned for freedom from tyranny. The problem was they had no place for God in their plans. And now in the long run, either way you have it, it isn't going to work. All things betray thee. Who betrayest me, says the Lord. And if any point in the story, they had confessed their sins, they had found forgiveness and fellowship again with God and blessing, before the angry confrontation, during it, or even after it, how differently this story would have ended. All people... What about us when the strain is put on our relationships and the pressures put on our nearest and dearest ties begin to pull them apart? What then? Do you advise a little psychotherapy? Plan a few new social activities to get back together, some financial security for the future? If so, you have missed the point of everything this Bible story is teaching. 
then you have made the same mistake these people long ago made. And you're playing the same old chess game. There is only one God and Father who is above all and through all and in all. He works his wonders from heaven when he doesn't seem to be working at all. He makes the wrath of mankind praise him as well as the worship of mankind. He rules the armies of heaven as well as the inhabitants of the earth. He blesses the faithfulness of his people and punishes their folly. Perhaps this day, you are passing through some dark night of the soul. Or maybe the sun is shining brightly on your head. Maybe the labor of your hands today has been crowned with success. Or possibly you are struggling with both hands just to make ends meet. Are you happy or does today find you eating the bread of sorrow? Always look straight up to God. Turn away from the secondary causes and consequences and look straight to the Lord who alone is your Savior and your King. Distrust the appearance of all things that are seen and look for the substance of things unseen. For that is the victory that overcomes this world, the Bible teaches. Even your faith. Amen. peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.